When I spit bars in a rave, man, I go hard like Santan. Hello, welcome to Chesi Awa. My name is Meads, I'll be your host for this evening. Um, and we've got three fantastic guests. We've got Joe, what are you saying, bro? Doing good, mate, yeah. Special after today, doing really well. How are you? I'm not too bad, man. Bit hot, bit hot, you know. It's a heat wave that we've had the last couple of days, but I'm surviving. I've got a decent fan, so <clears throat> I, can, I, can, I can survive a little bit. I can survive a little bit. Jay, what are you saying, brother? All good, man. All good. Yeah. If you guys could see on the um, on on uh, on the video, you could see that he has the American as, <laughs> as his name, uh, paying homage to a certain Chelsea player. But that's cool. It's cool. Say no more. Um, Pell, what are you saying, bro? I'm good, man. Um, shocked. <laughs> shocked. Yeah, that's the thing. You know what, guys? I just want to give you a bit of context, yeah? Because Pels was like, look, you know what, boys? I can't even guarantee my appearance because, look, if we get slapped emotionally, I don't know. I don't know. So I'm like, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a wreck. You know what I mean? Because, so, you know, Pels, Pels is all or nothing. All or nothing. So if they lose and we lose bad, that's it. He's done with Chelsea for a season. That's it. So I get it. I get it. Yeah, All right, well, feeling good now. Feeling good now. Yeah, of course, man. Um, but firstly, we obviously played two games since the last podcast. Um, I want to touch on Aston Villa because it was quite a different performance to um, obviously the City game. We'll get onto that a bit late, uh, a little bit later on. But um, the Villa performance, Jay, what were your thoughts on that? Because for me, I felt we looked quite decent. We seemed quite in control. Um, but what were your overall thoughts on our cutting edge, how we played, and performances of certain individual players? Um, obviously, I wasn't. I wasn't going to take. I wasn't going to be too harsh on the team because obviously it was their first game back after the break. But um, in terms of it being like an impressive performance, I like. I don't really think it was that at all because I feel like we. I think we controlled the game, which I which I'd expect us to do anyway, regardless, like with the quality that we've got in terms of like in midfield and stuff like that. But um, when it came to breaking them down, I think it was just very one-dimensional. I think we lacked urgency, like like large parts large parts of the game actually. I think we lacked lacked urgency. We was passing the ball slow. Some of it was really sloppy. But then. Um, we, yeah, we like we only had like a couple of players that were quite bright. I mean, Mason Mount was probably like our best player on the day, um, trying to make things happen. But like the way Villa were parked up behind, like you know, they had pretty much everyone behind the ball. Do you know what I mean? And, like the only guy that was making trying to make things happen was Grealish, and again, just sloppy um, defending to, to to give away the goal in the beginning. But generally, I think for the first game back, like. The way we controlled the game was decent, but it was just a bit disappointing just to see the way we just struggled to break them down. But we that's been us that's been our problem all season as well. So at the same time, I'm not really too shocked by it. If you it's almost sure. like you're you're so used to it now. You've seen this story so many times. Yeah. You it's like you're immune to the pain, basically. Yeah, yeah. You're numb <laughs> yeah, to the pain. That, you know the you're goals coming in. You know what I mean? You're numb to the pain. Cause I feel like when we were like, when I was watching the game initially, first couple of minutes, I'm like, okay, Chelsea look quite decent. Obviously, you kind of they've set into the pattern of they're gonna sit back, and I'm like, okay, we're moving the ball relatively quickly, and then it got to about 15 minutes, then everything started to slow. Everything was going slow, and I'm thinking, oh no, here we go again. Yeah, the longer it goes on, it's just like you're just waiting for that one set piece. Yeah, and. and then and there weren't any real clear moments. That was my thing. There was no real clear moments of quality. I feel like Mason Mount had that left-footed drive, which was a great effort. And then I think a couple of minutes later, he had a square pass to Ruben off the cheek. Um, just a yeah, yeah. Stick. Um, but other than that, there weren't really any chances. Um, Pels, what were your thoughts? I know you were quite disappointed um, when we were talking about the game, like during the game anyway. So what were your thoughts on it? Um, I think with Villa... The kind of early tempo was was decent. I think we played um, like mm. a, an okay tempo, mm. um, so I wasn't like 
fuming that you know maybe the ball was stuck with the centre halves and and that sort of stuff. Um, can, I, can I just pause you? Your language, bro. I swear. You <laughs> you're so. Do you know what? You're you're you preempt negativity so much. It's like you know what? This might be a long day. So fuck it. Yeah, I think it. it's hard. It's and but I think I just do that because um, if I lower the expectation, then I'm, I feel less disappointment. Mm-hmm. Um, is it the cop- is that's the, cop- the biggest hmm <laughs> statement ever it's a coping, yeah. it's a coping mechanism still you the emojis go. coming out hmm hmm you alright go on pal sorry bro yeah nice no, one you don't have your fun sorry bro sorry sorry oh, oh, um, well done well done well done, well done. so yeah, yeah no nah, I think I think yeah, I wasn't um, I wasn't too displeased at how we started. I think just my main my main thing is, um, and obviously we made a point of it kind of when talking about the game that our avenues to penetrate or to create chances typically just come from from wing play and wide areas. Um, I don't think necessarily. Well, I don't. I now don't get the impression necessarily that that's the like the go to plan. But um, Dan made a good point that that's probably what it ends up being or what it regresses to. Um, and yeah, and, I, and I'd probably agree with that in that we find ourselves um, often in scenarios where it's Azpi or Alonso crossing the ball. Um, and I just, neither of them, I mean, Alonso, is, is, his, his is more shocking because he clearly has an ability to strike the ball. But for what, I don't know why, but for one reason or the other, can't just put, can't put in you know, high quality, consistent delivery. Um, and then as Pete, like, we know that's not his, his, his game. And um, they're just constantly being relied on to, um, to, to deliver the ball. Um, our midfielders typically um, don't really sit in the pockets. There's not a lot of space for them to do so because of the way, the, you know, the teams are in, a park, in terms of parking the bus. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they leak out enough to kind of support, um, support the fullbacks or, the wingers leak out enough to support the fullback so that we can actually get, you know, a ball through and then maybe cut back or create a, a decent crossing angle. Um, so with that in mind, what tends to happen is that they just kind of run into the box and then it's as P and Alonso left to their own devices to kind of cross. Um, and I guess to some extent, someone might ask, well, why are you complaining? Because we, we scored from, from crosses, essentially. Um, or, or from like a type of like cutback area sort, sort of play. And I think... Um, that just because we do it 30 times, 40 times in the game and it comes off twice, um, it doesn't mean that that's the, probably like the optimal way or the best way to t- kind of create chances. Um, yeah. And I just, I think there's just a need for a balance. Um, and with that, it just highlights that kind of, um, the lack that need of for, yeah, the need for, for some more quality um, in there. I think Ruben was, um, was bad and I, and I, I don't really, as as a, someone that champions him, I'm not really too concerned about it. It's not surprising um, after kind of the amount of time that he's been out. But I think the with the other people maybe that I'd expect a bit more from is probably someone like Kovacic, um, who progresses the ball really well in terms of from the first third to the middle third in terms of dribbling um, and even his passing. Like they like to pass and play out of gaps, but it just feels like when those gaps appear from the middle to the final third. He's not as willing to kind of play those passes. I, I um, feel like I feel like Kovacic has. Um, he's usually our tempo setter, really and truly, especially in like the the big games. I feel like he he usually sets our tempo quite well. And the Villa game, everything was so slow from him, and it was quite weird because it. And that's why I feel like a lot of people said he looked poor, and, and I don't think he looked terrible. But everything was such it was such um, it was done so slowly. It's just not, you're just not used to it from him. So that's why I could see why you're disappointed in him for sure. Because I watched him and I thought, mm, this ain't what you're used to seeing. And again, he's been out, he's been like everyone else, he's been out for months. So it's very difficult to expect him to come back a hundred and raring to go. But I guess because you're used to him setting the tempo so much, when you compare him to the way Mount was buzzing around and trying to do everything, um, it, it made it even more obvious that he was kind of off the pace, really and truly. Um, but I do agree, in terms of what you were saying um, with the crossing, um, Joe, why is Aspie starting over Reese James? I, right now, anyway. 
Is this because of this injury? I know he came back to the training camp. Yeah. A little bit later because of his, I think he had another ankle injury. Um, why do you think that is? Is it mainly due to the injury? I think there's there's two things that at least from the angle that I take if I was Lampard, I think first of all, like Reese, I don't think I've I've really seen him being like 100% fit this season. Like when he comes back, I know we've all got a thing of Lampard sort of rushing people back into games. I think Reese has kind of come back. He's had a couple of good games and, and he sort of picked up sort of you know, little injuries here and there. Um, I think that's leaning something into it. But I also think these these sort of first couple of games, I can see Lampard leaning on experience a bit more. It's a unique situation, you know, as for, I, I, I don't actually, to be fair, we don't really give him grief on this podcast. I think he gets the sort of level of, of respect that he's due in terms of what he's done. But as, as an experienced level player, I think you kind of know you're going to get sort of a good six, six and a half out of ten from him sometime. I mean, he did, you know, he did pick up the two assists as well, which is also kind of gets lost a bit because they were a bit a bit weird in terms of how they got there. I think one was possibly slightly an overhit cross that ended up on, on Pulisic and the other was just a bit, a bit more of a scrappy cutback. But I think it has to be, for me, a bit more of an experience thing and maybe Reese's isn't fit. Mm. Um, but he does tend to start off a Lampard at the moment. So whether that's at left back or right back, I think he's one of those players, maybe it's just a character thing that Lampard likes in being on the pitch. I'd say similar to someone like Rudiger, who, again, I don't think we really all see as, as being the number one choice, but has this kind of uh, sort of leadership aura, if you want to say it from Lampard's perspective, and likes seeing him on the pitch because he's vocal and he's shouty and all this sort of stuff. A <laughs> little, little, bit, little bit the same for, you know, for, for Aspi, more calm and collected, yeah. um, but has that kind of respect level because he's been at the club for so long, he's captain, all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, but I think, you know, he, to be fair to Aspi, I think he did have an OK game, um, particularly against Villa. But I just think at the moment, weird situation for the club to be in. Last couple of games, get, get your kind of experienced heads in there. I think Aspi is, is the guy that Lampard looks to as being sort of his his kind of experienced player in that back four particularly. Yeah, I do th- I do agree with what Pels and obviously subsequently Dan, what they were saying in, in terms of our style of play. Because I remember earlier in the season, um, I think Dan, Yas and Pels to a degree had some reservations to why we kept getting it wide. And yeah. I felt like, just in terms of what we could do in the middle, like Mason Mount for me isn't unlocking doors. Um, Ruben probably could, but we didn't have Ruben. Um, obviously, Kovacic isn't doing that. Jorginho isn't doing that. Kante isn't doing that. Uh, Billy possibly could, but he wasn't playing at the time. Barkley could, but again, he wasn't playing at the time. So, in terms of creativity from the middle, despite the fact that we progress and get into these areas very, very well, mm. everything gets shunted out wide because they're not picking the pass or seeing the pass or trying to execute. Um, again, you know what Alonso is like. We always speak about his, his technical quality. And again, his striking, his ball striking when it comes to shooting, is super, superb. Superb. Yeah. But when it comes to taking consideration and care with his crossing and passing, and we've spoken about this on the pod many a time, he just hits it and like had it. He's like, here you go. Here you go. <laughs> he is, takes yeah. no due care. Takes no due care. As P, I feel like he does have that um, that inside right cross on smash for me. So, well, he's not playing as a, like a fullback, but he's playing like a like a, a right centre back that pushes on and he can cross from that angle. He does it really, really well. Um, but generally, his crosses and deliveries into the box is really, really poor. So, I guess that's why we're almost like baying for Reece James to play. And it, I, it's also kind of made me reassess slightly because I feel like. If we get our our middle third quality up to standards, like so, you get a Kai Havertz, um, obviously Hakim Ziyech, then you won't necessarily need to keep shunting it out wide. So that also reduces the need to have superb fullbacks with their um, amazing deliveries. You, you get what I'm trying to say? So yeah, that kind of brings us on to to, to squad depth. But we'll get onto that a little bit later on. I kind of want to touch on the big game today against Manchester City. Um, now, seeing the lineup, um, I remember Pels, I think Pels and Yas were saying, okay, so it's a good lineup. I was quite worried, to be honest, um, because I've seen N'Golo Kante in the pivot, um, the single pivot by himself. Did it well against Aston Villa, but he wasn't really up against much because Villa pretty much were camped, up, um, camped in their own box for most of the game. Um, so it was easy for them to control. But 
this game, I was quite worried when I saw the lineup because I felt like Barkley and Mount were leaving quite exposed. And, you know, Kevin De Bruyne, uh, David Silva, um, Bernardo Silva, they're all local. So I was quite worried that he'd get pulled out of position. Um, how did the game go for you guys? And how do you think um, Kante, I guess, in that role, performed? And do you possibly see him there long term in the future? Um, we'll go, Jay, what do you think of it? Yeah, no, I, th- I think um, generally throughout the game, I think the structure of the team was quite impressive, to be honest. I, f- I feel like they kept their shape quite well throughout the majority of their game. And I think um, in terms of Kennedy playing DM, <laughs> defensively, he was, I think, again, he was quite impressive. I think like, he, was, he was snuffing a lot of stuff, like danger out. He was making tackles when he needed to. But I think um, there were times when he did have the ball and he was worrying like he was worrying me a little bit with, with some of the short passes that he was kind of missing. They were very like easy passes and some of the decisions as well that he was making were a bit questionable at times. But it was a bit loose. I think his passing generally was was a bit loose today. Yeah, like slightly, like some only sometimes. Like I don't think it was throughout like large parts of the game where he was doing it, but I think there was just certain passes that you'd see him do and, and it would just be like you like you were you, it weren't you know it weren't um it's basically you're looking at the pass and thinking oh Billy's hitting that oh Jorginho's hitting that basically basically, basically I get you basically. but but in terms of defensively though you could definitely see the difference and for me that's always been my first thing like my first thing in terms of in that position is how good are you defensively in it and I know a lot of men talking about Jorginho and all these stats about how good he is defensively in that but he ain't doing what he's doing in terms of the way he snuffs out danger, in terms of the way he doesn't get... Like, you can't ragdoll Kante, in it. Like, I don't think that that's happened. Like, with Jorginho there, I think I've seen it too much where players just walk all over him sometimes, and I don't like it. So, I'm, I'm all for Kante playing there. Um, and I think he'll probably get better at it as well, to be fair. He is, he is quite basic in that position, but, like, in terms of his passing. But... Um, yeah, like I said, the main thing in terms of defensively, I think he's, I think he's still quality there. So. I feel like, I feel like him playing there, it does take a lot away from his game. Mm. But Joe, I think you'll probably be able to chime in a little bit more. Um, and I kind of, Jay, as well, this alleviates a bit of your concerns because I remember you were talking about, oh, Kante might be injured or he might be injury prone now. Yeah, but him being in a, a slightly more restrictive role might be better for him in terms of longevity wise. Um because yeah, he's not gonna that's be a great point, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great point. Joe, do you see this as a long term solution um to get Kante in the side? And obviously there are gonna be some casualties um <laughs> in terms of certain positions and certain players. Um what are your thoughts? Do you see this as a long term solution um to play Kante in a single pivot by himself? Um I mean, I think this, this might sound weird to people who know that I'm, I'm certainly not in favour of, of having Jorginho or some of that kind of profile style there. My own personal preference is to have someone a bit more athletic, a bit more defensive. Um, but looking at Kante, and this is something that Yaz was mentioning to me in the Villa game, is, is it's, it's, it's okay for someone to be sort of defensive and be in those positions and have the, you know, sort of the athletic quality and, and sort of the, the natural defensive instincts to kind of play there. But... I saw a little bit today that, you know, when, when Kante is, is just sitting there, his natural instinct to hunt and tackle and win the ball back, that kind of gets stunted. So for me, I think potentially you'll see it used a little bit over the past couple of games or the, the, the next couple of games coming up. But in terms of sort of long-term planning, I, I still think that there's, there's room to, to bring in a different sort of profile of play. I think he, what you were saying means is, is absolutely spot on. I think he, there's too much that's taken away from his game by asking him just to sit anchor and sort of sweep up and, and, and clean things up and just be that kind of defensive foil. Um, I have a lot of reservations about him receiving the ball in tight areas. Um, not saying that he's he's a bad footballer or whatever, but there's there's a certain kind of profile of player who's comfortable, but like Kovacic, comfy receiving it like you know back to back to someone. You know, receiving it on kind of his his you know his his furthest foot away from goal and, and being able to either turn or play around the corners and, and sort of alleviate pressure that way. Some of the the passing that Kante was doing was a little bit sketchy, but 
I think we're in a, just in a position now where Lampard is, is caught between two minds. You have the, the, the ability to play those little passes around the corner to move the ball a little bit quicker with Jorginho there, potentially with, with Billy Gilmore as well. I think what you lose defensively is, has been exposed a lot this season and last season. If you put Kante there, I think we, we look a lot more solid. I think Jay's point about us looking a lot more structured is, is true. I think that there's a more structure to the team there. Um, but then you're, you're kind of relying on on your centre-backs playing those passes or, or bypassing um, Kante or him playing you know, passes that maybe he's not, more, not as comfortable with. So I don't think it's a, it's a perfect balance going forward. But in games like City, you know, the thing that I've, I've said for, for a while is that they, you know, I remember reading an article and a presentation from one of their actual analysts that they specifically said that we, we pinpoint Jorginho. We know that he jumps out. We know that he, look, he comes to that position. And we literally train a week just to play around him. And there's been goals that's, that have happened, you know, when he's been there, that basically just come from them just, just picking up on something that he has a tendency to do. With Kante sitting in there, I didn't feel that they really got in those, those same spaces that, that, that I've seen them get in for the past, you know, the couple of times we've played them. So it's a fine balancing act. I think there'll be games, you know, games that Kante suits there, games that maybe Jorginho suits there, um, or, or Gilmore potentially as well. But I think at the moment, we're looking at like the long term that position. I think that, that that player probably doesn't exist at the, or doesn't certainly belong um, at, at the club at the moment. So, I, I would say, you know, someone, uh, you know, someone potentially on the market that, that the club would be looking to bring in, someone who is who, who has a little bit more te- technical capacity as well as the sort of defensive skills set. But it doesn't feel like Lampard's got that well-rounded option to put in there at the moment. Ampadu might have been interesting because he does have a little bit of uh, the ability to receive and play, and also the aggression as well. But um, that's probably more of a kind of future projection than anything that's, that's sort of relevant at the moment. So, yeah, long term, unsure if, if, if that's going to be Kante's role. I think you lose too much from his game by not putting him in that right central midfield spot. Um, but the defensive quality that he brings, it, even just by his, his profile, that it's Kante in there. Yeah. I think teams respect that it's Kante more than having someone else there as well. Wow. Well, Pels, um, just on the game in general, mate. Um... Considering that you had a very negative outlook <laughs> before the, the ball was kicked, um, how do you feel we done? And were there any special mentions you wanted to give? Because uh, we'll, we'll touch on Christian Pulisic um, a little bit later on. But was there any um, performances that you thought, okay, yeah, you know what, you were good today? Um, I think um, Jay kind of hit the, the nail on the head with regards to the structure. I think we defended as a unit quite well. Um, I worry just. Generally speaking, I worry about teams that really sit into a low block because of um, the amount of pressure that you kind of invite on. Uh, and, I th- and I think because they didn't have a recognised number nine, um, we were able to kind of... There was, there was instances where I saw people like Christensen maybe just step on to Kevin De Bruyne a bit um, and nick the ball back. Generally speaking, you know, our, our, our distances were, were pretty good. Um, there was a few instances where I felt like Rudiger and Alonso might get caught out. But gener- generally... Um, the structure was good. I think um, they weren't able really to penetrate. Um, and, and despite them dominating the ball and having like most of the proceedings um, in possession, I think we were relatively comfortable. It doesn't, I don't ever feel comfortable watching us defend. <laughs> um, and I, would, I won't say that I did feel comfortable per se, but in terms of them not you know, cutting, cutting and carving through us, um, that was a, like a really, really good thing. I think um, both centre-halves, played well today um, and I think Alonso to some degree even though I was worried did a did a fairly decent job on Mares. Um and that was that's, it's just testament to the whole structure I think the what the way that they we pressed or, or didn't press at times um, was good and that meant that they didn't get a lot of kind of opportunities to really to really um, have a go on have a have a go or have a shot um, yeah. I, with, I, I completely agree about the structure and I feel like Kante kind of tied it all together, in my opinion. Because, like Joe said, Jorginho does have a massive tendency to step out and break the structure of our side. And once he gets bypassed, teams are into us. And that becomes a big, big issue. Kante was very, very reserved today. Um, swept up in front of Christiansen and Rudiger. Who Christiansen, for me, I thought was man of the match or Kante. Um, but I completely agree. Defensively, we look very, very assured. Um, comfortables, are str- I think, comfortable maybe a, a bit strong, but assured. We were untroubled a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, but offensively, Jay, um, I, I want, let, let, let me give Jay the floor because he, he's got 
you know, the American as his name. I, I kind of want him to chime in on a certain man. So, Jay, the, the floor is yours quickly, man. Yeah, and I, in, in terms of offensively, I think um, I had a feeling it was going to be a kind of similar pattern to before, like throughout the season, where we were going to create chances and we weren't going to put them away and we were going to get punished, definitely going to get punished by City. That's kind of like what I thought was going to happen. So I wasn't surprised to see us get chances. But in terms of offensively, I felt like, I felt out of the three when I was looking at them, I did feel like Pulisic was going to be the one to kind of make something happen out of the three. Because I just know Willian's not going to give me anything. I know that for a fact. And then with Giroud, I think Giroud's game is, is more like, obviously, to bring people into play. And I felt, I felt like Pulisic could use him a bit today. But um, I, I was quite impressed with Pulisic. Like, in terms of the way he's hungry to get goals, that's one thing I have been impressed, of, like, impressed with the most about him. Like, he seems to like, be really hungry to get in the box and try and nick a goal or get a goal like, throughout the game. And he'd done it, again. obviously, he came coming against Villa and he'd done it then. He didn't have a great game against Villa, by all means. Like, I don't think he played that well against Villa. But... Um, he he de he definitely showed a desire to kind of get into the box and, and obviously he ended up getting the equaliser. But for City, for the City goal, looked very alive when when obviously they made the mistake. And just again, his dribbling ability, like the way he eases past players, I don't know, like I don't know how much you like you guys rate his dri dribbling ability in it. Like I feel like his dribbling ability is up there in terms of the, the attackers that we've got at the club at the moment. I don't think many dribble better than do you get what I'm saying? Like in terms of his close close control, the way he that just goes past players sometimes, he does it very easily. And if you look at like for the for the goal he scored today, just before Mendy, uh, I think it was, was it Mendy that tried to nick it just before he just before he breezed past him. He he it waits. Mendy. It was Mendy. Yeah, he waits. He literally waits for him to just stick his foot out, and as soon as he does that, knocks it past him. He's gone. He stood like, him. He stood him up well. I think that was just. Uh, so get the yard. I think that was good play. That was quality play. He's quite intelligent. Oh, I think he's quite intelligent with his dribbling. So I think, but I, I do feel like there's a lot. This, I don't want like fans of Pulisic to get too carried away with the fact that because he's scoring these goals, it means that like for the full 90 minutes, he was like, you know, a constant threat because I think that's where he needs to improve. I think he needs to improve on being that threat throughout the game, like consistently throughout the game. I think, Sometimes his passing was a little bit sloppy in terms of um, when he was trying to pass it into like Giroud sometimes or like little free balls that he was trying. Like he he definitely needs to improve on that. But just gen generally though, I did feel like he was a threat today, and I and I was quite confident when he got the ball. I, I thought like something was going to happen with it today. Mm. But uh, um, sorry, to yeah. Um, no, no, just got one on Pulisic. So I felt like so I felt like his performance before the goal. Was pretty much like what we were used to with Pulisic, really. Um, quite yeah. passive, yeah. Quite, quite passive. Um, passing isn't always hitting, but that's fine because at least he's trying to do stuff. Obviously, he worked really hard, works really hard. Um, but there was just like a, a lack of aggression, and I always feel like I say on this pod quite often, and I probably tweet it quite often. I feel like if Pulisic adds. 10 20 percent more aggression in his game on a consistent basis, then he will be a very good player. But I feel like he's not aggressive enough, and I feel like the moment he starts adding aggression into his play, um, he looks good, he looks really, really good. Um, but it's just getting that level of consistency, and again, he's still only 21 22, so yeah. I feel like maybe that might come. Um, Pels, what did you think of Pulisic's performance? And again, obviously, we could touch on Aston Villa cameo as well. Um, but what did you think of um, how, how he did? I guess how our attack um, did. Um, no, I think I felt, like, I felt that we were threatening, um, but I felt, yeah. What What did you think? Um, I think I go back to maybe um, the the last game um, that we played City in, and I felt like I felt as though they did a real job on us in terms of pressing us and we struggled to play out quite a bit. So when I saw the lineup in terms of Barkley and the, the ingenuity he's capable of, even though he didn't have, he didn't have much of a, an impact on the game today, um, I thought that was a good sign um, that we would have someone that can actually try to, you know, um, maybe create a chance yeah. if, if, if he got into the right position. 
Um, but the thing that was really most impressive to me was when we were being pressed from goal kicks um, early in kind of in the first half, I think we, we played out fairly well. Um, and the commentators made a point that I kind of was, was a little bit like antsy about in terms of launching the ball. But yeah. I think that, that tactic worked in terms of turning, turning them over, as they said, or mm-hmm. kind of just, but just thoughtful balls. I think in the first game, the, the balls were a little bit hopeless mm-hmm. and might stick it up there. Um, whereas there oh, was well, a, that, was a, Tammy was playing as well. I think yeah, and that, that's another thing as well. Um, yeah. Whereas in this instance, Rudiger, I saw like Rudiger got the ball on his left side and kind of like clipped the ball into Giroud mm-hmm. and Giroud brings it down and plays Pulisic in. And I felt like there was just a, there was a more kind of thoughtful approach to the build-up. Um, we didn't just force the ball long, but we also didn't force, you know, playing, playing, um, playing through them. It was like there was a lot more cohesion yeah. in that long ball. It made there a, sense. Yeah. There was a lot more cohesion yeah. in the play. And, the there was a good, and literally, and there was a good balance of that. And then even when the subs were made, I feel like they wanted to stretch them. And it was just, there was just a lot more consideration for how we built the play up. I think my gripe with Kante, like, I was almost, it was like begging him, like, like will you turn? No, I, I couldn't. I couldn't take it, um, and I think obviously, like you guys mentioned before, that's probably maybe the one element of his game that he's not he's not the strongest at, and it's probably the a difficult thing as a possession team because you a lot of possession teams want to play through their DM, and if you don't, then it requires a Barkley amount to drop in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I, and I, to be honest, the, the two interiors so in in Mount and Barkley, I don't think they had a massive impact on the game, but they didn't need to because it was it was more or less a defensive performance and and. Their aim was when we when we had the ball, can we play? But it wasn't like, um, you know, we, we didn't dominate proceedings in that way. So I didn't mind it. Um, yeah. Who I, just Kristen Pulisic, I think for me is he's a talented player. I don't think there's any like kind of doubt in that. Yeah. What I would say is that um, initially when he when he was you know rumored to be signed or when he was signed, was he my preferred style of winger? No, um, and I think that was mainly because. After years of watching, you know, our team suffer from goals or lack of goals, I saw us, what I literally saw was us sign a player with potential that, my, I'd say my assertion was that he, he probably wasn't on goals. Like he wasn't going to be a really productive um, goal-threatening winger in the, in, the, in the same realm of like a Robin. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. If that was like, if that's my ideal type of, my ideal type of winger. Um, but what he's shown a real natural knack for um is one getting into positions to score which i think is some which is why the impact that he made at villa was so important um not i don't think he played like particularly well in terms of his general play but just that willingness to get in like that's some that's something william doesn't do william doesn't get in at the back post right. if you were to look at like all of the goals you know william scored i'd be shocked if he had many of those types i don't think, I think singles happen yeah and i think and i think pulisic on the other hand has had maybe two or three of those of his eight. And I think that's a really, really um, important trait to have. So the, I'm happy that he's proved that he's capable of getting into his positions. Um, with, with regards to kind of just some of what, um, in terms of his, his general play, he's someone that I don't, I know he's not aggressive, but I, I see it sometimes almost as timidity in terms of he wants to kind of play a bit safe. Yeah. Um, I think he's a pass first Footballer in that um, he's not very. He, I don't see him as single-minded. Um, but what, how that is when that is good is that he's always looking to kind of play someone in or or get his head up. So he might even though he might take two or three touches initially to carry, he always wants to release. Um, and sometimes for me, it's you know when I guess when we're playing against a low block and there's it's a one v one situation, you want someone to kind of just dribble like a dama. Do you get what I mean? And just take someone on. And he's not that type of player. And I think that's where. My gripes are with him in that he's just not my preferred style of winger, but yep. he's clearly a talented one. Yeah. Um, so with so with his game today, that um, initially, yeah, I think there was a little bit of timidity again. But once he kind of got into a groove, once he's you know the goal, what he's done for the goal is is like sick. Like yeah, different class. The, the that's composure that's nice. on the finish as well is fantastic. Um, the there was a part. There was just a little point where he got the ball in possession, took kind of three or four touches and just like knocked it wide to Willian. But it's just all so quick and it was like such a good tempo. And I just, I almost, I see him as like a wide playmaker um, more in terms of that, like um, I'm not necessarily here to dribble at you consistently or to, you know, take on a million people or, you know, to cut in and shoot. 
yeah. I want to I want to link with others. I want to bring other people in. Yeah. Um, and I and I, I just think the it's it's ironic to me, or not ironic, but it's it's almost it's no surprise that the two games in which people kind of would have seen that Pulisic was is one in the Burnley game in terms of he had a he had a positive moment and just said I'm going to go for it. Yeah. And then and then everything came to fall into place. And then today was another day where it was like he had he was on it in that way. Yeah. Um, even late on, like I felt like oh, let's keep the ball, let's manage the game. But he's still dribbling, he's still, and it's just like he had that buzz, he was feeling himself. Yeah. Um, so he, I think he, I think he played, I think he played well today. Um, it, and the chance that he missed in terms of not getting on, like not, I, I guess it being cleared off the line, the yeah. composure he showed to round the keeper and stuff like that. That stuff is not, that stuff is not, um, is not common. Do you get what I mean? Like not everyone is is that composed. So mm-hmm. I, he's got some. He's got some traits that I really like, and he's got some that I don't like I feel, as much. I feel, um, like, I feel like with him, yeah, the one thing that you have to give him his 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 dues is, I feel like he's almost like a tireless worker in just in terms of his mental approach to games, hundred um, percent, a, a, a mental approach to to criticism, um, and obviously not being, because I feel like, you know, I feel like he 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 works hard, so I feel if he if he is almost like looked at like a squad player, I feel like he's the type, he's got the mentality to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to work my hardest to make sure that I'm in the starting 11. And if I'm not in the starting 11 and I'm given an opportunity, I'm going to make sure that I, I, take the, I make the most of it. And I have to give him his dues because mentally, one of the hardest things about being at a big club and you're part of a big squad with a lot of quality and a lot of competition a lot of players can buckle under that. And that's not necessarily to say they're bad players. But because you feel that, okay, I should be playing on a regular basis and you don't, like say Romelu Lukaku, for example. Some people say that he was impatient at Chelsea. Some people say that, oh, he was more than good enough to play for Chelsea. But he took the decision upon himself and said, you know what? I'm not built for this competition stuff. I just, I think I should play. I think I deserve to play. I think Pulisic's mentality is quite different. And you have to give him props for it because he knuckles down. He literally knuckles down. And you can see it in his performance. You can see it in his work ethic as well that he is a grafter. So when, it, when, when challenges are thrown at him, he will rise to them. And that, that's, I think I, I will struggle to take that quality away from him because I think that's one of his key traits. And um, I, think, I think that's going to be important as well, especially I mean, like, people need to remember, I think obviously, especially Chelsea fans need to remember that, this quality that we've got at the moment up top isn't the quality that we normally have when we're going to like when we're going off to try and win titles and that. So with Pulisic, as, as good as he's doing now, and uh, like in in terms of some of the games and some of the cameos that he's had, and like obviously he's scoring goals, which is good. Like next season, he's going to be contending with people like Werner playing out wide left, Ziyech playing out wide right. So like. There's a possibility that he's even going to have to up his level. Again, like, not even a possibility. It's not even a possibility. He will have to up his level, yeah. like levels much more. And then you've got someone like Cho coming back. Who it's cool. People can forget. You know, they can forget about Cho for now. Like he's had his injuries and he hasn't had the greatest of seasons. But someone like Cho coming back, he's going to be hungry. You get what I'm saying? He's going to be hungry. He's going to be fit. He's going to be ready. So it will be interesting to see how. Pulisic reacts to to uh, that's the one thing coming in. That, that's the thing, though. I feel like if you have squad players that are hungry, it's not it's not a bad thing ever. It will never be a bad thing. And no one here is saying that Pulisic is poor or not good at football. Definitely, but the fact that he's relatively timid or relatively passive almost makes and when you know what you want in terms of a winger, you want a bit of aggressivity. You want them to be aggressive and try and take the game to, to the opponents all the time. Um, so when you have a stark contrast in winger, so who's quite timid and quite, you know, not even laid back, but they're more considered in their approaches, right? Um, if it goes against your grain of what you want in a winger, you're just going to be like, oh, I kind of want the aggressor. I want the aggressor. I want the, aggreg- the aggravator on the pitch. You know what I mean? I, think Christian, you play, you, you, I feel like Chris. I feel like Christian. Like with him, I think the challenges that will come 
with the Verners, with the even Havertz, if, if he does come, um, Ziyech, Hudson Odoi. If there's one player in our squad, and maybe Mason Mount as well, I think him and Mason Mount have similar qualities in terms of their mental, um, their mental side. I think those two probably will be more than happy to like, face the challenges head on, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they'll shirk from the channel. I think he's going to play. A, he's going to be playing a dangerous game if he if he only shows up. Like Paul said, like when he when he has like and like if he has to wait to have a good moment. And yeah. Then, like all of a sudden you're feeling yourself and now you want to play because like, those moments are very rare. Yeah, and that's a dangerous game to play because then you're like you could go for the majority of the season not having great games. You know what I mean? So right. so you're definitely going to have to get used to like trying to do that from the off. Like just yeah. as soon as you start the game, and like, this is what this is what well, this is why I say like when I first watched him, like for Dortmund and stuff, I was thinking, you know what? In terms of the mold, very similar to William in the sense that he needs to have moments in games, and then he's off. You know what I mean? Pulisic is pretty much like that. You know, so he might not, he might not have a, a great, fantastic game, but he'll have a couple moments of quality, and then he starts to to get going. So. It's interesting. Joe, what are your thoughts on Pulisic? Um, obviously, we, we, we dubbed him the American. Um, <laughs> has, has, he, has he earned his, um, his first name, at least? I, th- so, I think he's, yeah, he's graduated to Christian after, yeah? after today's performance of me. Yeah, yeah I've been no. seeing Christian in, like, we're Bridgens as well. I've yeah. <laughs> I, I have to promote it. I have to promote it still. I think the, the, the interesting thing for me is I, I think so many of Chelsea's like wide players, like historically Hazard, Willian, et cetera, they always want the ball to feet. They always want to, they always want the ball to feet. And I think the one thing that Pearl said and actually just taking it a step further about you know, Pulisic, his ability to get on the end of things, he's one of the few players we have that actually wants to run in behind. Mm-hmm. And it's such a basic concept. But I think if you get a little bit more of that kind of balance, it's a little bit like when Pedro plays. You know, he, he, the amount of goals that he's had where he's made that little run in behind the uh, centre-back through, through that kind of full-back centre-back channel. And, and I'm seeing, certainly in the goals that Pulis scored, maybe this one was, is a little bit different, but that ability to get in behind defences is, for me, I think something that he can start using as his kind of calling card to differentiate himself from other players. Definitely, I think he's more a wide playmaker traditionally. If this sort of goal-scoring kind of mentality that he seems to be adopting it's going to become his thing. Then his ability to get in behind, to make those runs, to get in on the back post, to almost be a little bit like the American Mohamed Salah in that kind of style, you know, that sort of goal-scoring kind of positions that he finds himself in. I think that's going to be the calling card. And, you know, the finish for the goal was was absolutely exquisite in terms of how he took it. And to be honest, when he was through, when he took that with that touch pass, mainly that little dink over his foot, I thought he's going to score here. And I know we've, we've said it so many times, you know, looking at players, we don't really bank on that many scoring one ones at Chelsea. And actually, when Pulisic was through on that angle, I thought, you know what, this is in. Mm. Um, and the first time that I've, I've kind of felt that about a player in a while. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think Pulumi really nailed it in terms of, of you know, kind of the, the general breakdown of him. But I think that the only thing really that I see that he, that he adds kind of beyond what we have at the moment, I'm thinking a little bit to, to what Werner can do in terms of those sort of runs in behind. I think Pulisic gives you a little bit of that as well, a little bit of wide playmaker, the ability to run in behind. Yeah. And if you're going to play on the counter, you need people with pace up top. You know, Giroud's not going to sprint past, you know, an entire back four. You know, Mount is, is quick, but he's not going to make up that amount of ground. So having Pulisic up there to, to sort of get in behind, I think he's, he's something that we, we can see probably going forward a little bit more because it just, it just keeps teams honest. You know, if you know that all of a sudden actually this guy's going to run in t- behind, you know, five times out of ten, can you play on the halfway line the entire game? Can you really push up and squeeze it if he's going to do that? So I was impressed. I, I thought, you know, overall game today, I, think, I don't think he, he is as involved as I'd want him to be from like a personal sort of preferential standpoint. But the, the goal and I think just his... There were little pockets of play during the game, which I think are really encouraging, particularly heading into next season as well. Yeah, well, one thing that I feel like probably a lot of people have not really mentioned is um, his composure in front of goal. Um, Pell said it absolutely spot on earlier. Um, his composure is why you're so confident that he would yeah. either score or work the goalkeeper. Um, because I feel like even Mason Mount, um, he had a moment in the second half where it was his left foot, but he absolutely should have hit the target at the very least. 
That was um, someone of his ability. Yeah, he should have hit right. it. But at the same time, I feel like I've seen Mason Mount have that opportunity at least five times this season. Yeah, I remember he had that moment against I think Valencia. He had that moment against Liverpool in um, not the Super Cup. He had that moment against Liverpool in um at the home leg, um in our home match. Yeah, Mister One on One, um. And again, Man City, again, I feel like he has these moments. Um, but if you compare the level of composure that Pulisic has um, to Mounts, it's night and day. It is night and day. Um, Pulisic seems a lot more calmer. And I guess that may be... It's almost like if you look at their personalities, right? And their personalities on the pitch, I feel like Pulisic, again, very, very timid and I wouldn't say... He's not as aggressive, right? Whereas Mason Mount in his football, the way he plays football, is very aggressive, very high tempo. So it's very, very rush, rush, rush. So in the mind, there's no real composure in his play because he's so aggressive and he's so bang, 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 let's go. Everything's quite instantaneous and quite quick. And whereas yeah. Budicic, everything is quite considered, measured. And that kind of, I think that helps him with his, um, with his finishing. We're finishing as his composure, a million percent. Because if he was darting around like a, a million miles an hour, I, I don't think his composure yeah. and his mean, finishing would be as good. Do you know what? That link... Sorry, Joey. That, I think that link you made is, is sick in that. Um, you get a lot with um, Sterling and Salah in that they're always like going at such pace that when they sometimes get into those scoring positions, um, you know, there's, there's like a... A, a shoddy touch or yeah. there's something a bit messy that goes in or you know yeah. it hits off the other foot even like his even his finish against Villa he said he scuffed it and I think that comes from you know sprinting in the back post and yeah. it's a little bit more difficult with Mount what's, what's ironic is that I think the only time he shows that rush is before he's about to wind up for a shot because he wants to flip in lash it whereas yeah. um, <laughs> in, like generally speaking though his play is very considered and very measured but it's like when, when he's gone, even just like when he nicked the ball off in Didi, it's like he's nicked it and he's rushing. And exactly. that, time, that time he's, he's done it, but then generally speaking, um, it's a little bit harder for obviously for that to come off. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I guess just with, to round off with Pulisic, I think um, the, one, the one thing I'll be kind of looking out for is if this level of productivity, which I think is very solid, um, Considering the amount of minutes he's played now, looking looking back at it, I wonder if he can stretch it out across the course of the season, which has been difficult because of because of injury. Um, but yeah, if he can stretch it out and if he can can maintain like a similar rate, because Level, you yeah. know some of the goals came in some of the, I guess the the Burnley thing has his, the Burnley hat trick has has maybe kind of skewed it a bit in terms of. Yeah. How consistency or uh, how consistently story or how um, frequently he scores, yeah. but um, yeah, like he's certainly he certainly surpassed my productivity expectations. Right, um, based on kind of what he's done at Dortmund, and so yeah, so yeah. Yeah, because I feel like even already he scored as many goals in the league as William ever has. So <laughs> that is scary. I think, I think you know when you look yeah, his face to, was so happy then. <laughs> you know, so like, hey, look, look, you know, you know, look, I'm I'm a man about facts. I'm just sorry. Yeah, no, well, I'm just so back. in the league. So um sorry, I, I want to move away from Christian because we sorry, oh, we have we have we spoken about him at length and obviously um yeah, I'd I'd say that performance wise, I wouldn't say it was fantastic, but he had moments of quality in the game where you could see he's got talent, a million percent. Like, like you guys said, the goal, the moment that he stood up, Mendy, yeah, you just knew. One-on-one, -on -one, he's gone. And then the finish, side netting, man. Come on. It's class. It's quality. It's quality goal. Um, but I was talking about our midfield a little bit earlier on. Um, and obviously, Kante at the base. And um, I kind of want to talk about not necessarily additions, but what does this mean for um, like a Jorginho? Because obviously, Billy Gilmore came on before he did. I don't think, no, Jorginho didn't, didn't get on at all. Um, but Gilmore came on and obviously showed flashes of what he could do. Do you think this possibly could be the end of the road for Jorginho? Or maybe, because it's 10 minutes left, 
I'm going to give the young boy a run out. What do you think it is? I, I don't know, man. I, oh, I think it might be quite ominous still. What do you guys think? Oh, uh, man. I think Lampard's kind of... By Lampard doing what he's doing with Kante, it's, it's quite a big statement. Do you know mm. what I mean? Mm. Like, you've gone out of your way now to move Kante from his usual position, which is yeah. pretty box-to-box. You've now put him into a pivot, which is where Jorginho always plays if we play 4-3-3. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's like, that's his formation. Do you know what I mean? That's Jorginho's formation. 4 3 3 So, the fact, obviously, he's been suspended for two games. So, he was suspended for, for Villa. But then, to come into a big game like this, you, you know, where possession was probably going to be quite important as well in terms of keeping the ball. If you wanted to keep the ball mm. and, you know, try and pick it up from the defenders and, and keep it moving and that you would have probably played Jorginho. Mm. So the fact that you haven't, I don't know, man. For me, if I was him, and I'm looking at Billy Gilmore as well, and I'm looking at the couple games that he's played, and I'm thinking, this is a bit sticky for me right now, you know? Because, boy, listen. I know. I I I think Billy, like with a few more games under his belt, and, you know, a little bit more development, I already think Billy will be better than Jorginho, you know, innit? Like, that's me. That's me. No, no. Like, that's just my personal opinion. That's fair. He's that's got fair. a little bit more about He's got no. a little bit more about him. So. Joe, this, this must be music to your ears, bro. Because you've been waiting for this moment for quite some time still. And we've been talking about Chelsea's midfield composition for ages. And obviously, we're looking at beyond this season now. Yeah. Um, given that we're heavily linked with Kai Havertz. Um, could this be the end for Jorginho? Have you won the war? <laughs> yeah, this is literally it, bro. Because you've been battling against this guy for what? Two seasons now. So. Two seasons, yeah. No. Um, I don't know. Like, If you could see me now, obviously, I, I, I definitely go with the... Uh, <laughs> was it what, what am I? Jay Huncho, apparently. Yeah, I keep it. No <laughs> face. No Huncho, face, yeah. no case. But the <laughs> smile on my face at the moment is is, is pretty, uh, pretty indicative. But... Uh, I mean, so I have a massive personal preference, both like me as a football player, but football players that I've grown up watching and, and wanted to base my game on that. Holding players, specifically in the Premier League, for me, have to have some physical element to their game. City, for me, were absolute, when they're at absolutely at their peak, Fernandinho, boss in midfield. Mm. We've had Mikel, we've had Essien, we've had Makaleli. We've had some of the best players in, you know, in Premier League history to do that position. Makaleli. You know, short, you know, kind of, but in terms of his defensive quality, unbelievable. Mm. And, you know, I, I think I was, I was excited when we signed Jorginho, first of all. You know, I, I really was. I thought that he could be sort of an interesting player for us. But, yeah, I mean, that, that defensive stuff for me, I, I mean, I noticed it early on last season when I was watching him play. Um, I remember I just, quite well. I remember quite well, yeah. She used to point it yeah. out. And no one was really paying attention because we were winning the games. Yeah. No one was really paying attention, and Joe was like, I want to be happy. <laughs> I want to be happy, but I'm just not because I see where this is going. Oh. It's the thing, you know, people, people get massively in their feelings when I attack your genius because <laughs> it's been such a consistent thing. But it comes back to the same thing. Like for me, the spine of the team is the most important aspect of, of how you build a football team. Every great Chelsea team has had, down the middle of that team, has had absolute ballers in every single position. And when I, when I see Jorginho getting brushed off the ball by, like, James Madison and, you know, like, uh, who's the, um, the, be- the Bex kid at, at Norwich, who, you know, I always forget the guy's name. But, Samuel. Yeah, exactly, yeah. He, you know, he, has, he has been weights by, be- like... By, by not, not particularly good players. And, you know, when... <clears throat> and I think when, when this, that City article came up from the analyst saying, look, you know... The, we, we basically train to do this in games because we've noticed that he does this sort of stuff. Then people are like, oh, yeah, someone from Man City said it, so it must be true. I'm like, okay, I've been saying it for like nearly 18 months now. But <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a coach. But um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, I just, I just see the, the, the trend that it's going in is, is for me, I think Lampard, Lampard wants a happy medium between someone who's a decent player, technically, Dennis Sicario is a name that, that I like in terms of that sort of profile. 
someone who's a great technician but has the physical profile to be a, a proper kind of screen in front of the back four in terms of Premier League football. Uh, Sumari, the guy at Lille that we played against this season, another great, great player, I think, in terms of the, the kind of profile player that Lampa wants. I don't think he's completely sold on Kante. I really don't think he's sold on Jorginho playing there. Um, Gilmore, for me, is, is the kind of the nice sort of medium between a bit of Kante and, and and Georgina at the moment, he's got a bit more bite. He can still do all the sort of the nice passing and stuff. But mm -hmm. I think in the long term, that, that getting someone in um, externally probably is going to be the, the way to solve it. And someone, as I say, someone like Zakari or Sumari, that kind of profile of player, you know, tall, physical, can play sideline to sideline, can play box to box if you want to, win tackles, good at passing, you know, great, great sort of technical feet, mm -hmm. get themselves out of trouble, can dribble. You know, sort of really, really well-rounded players. But... You know, it, it comes back to the, the same thing. You know, it's, there's a physical element to that role in the Premier League that I feel you have to have for teams to be successful. Liverpool won the league. Fabinho has played there a lot. Their, their entire midfield three is just PMP, physical yeah. grafting type players. You know, and I think we've got a little bit sidetracked by the Sarri methodology and, and wanting like a Perlo type player in there. But all the best Premier League teams, I think, have had someone of that kind of style in there. You know, they've had someone who's a ball winner. And yeah, maybe you want to progress it a bit more. Someone who's a bit more technical and, and a ball winner, which you can get these days. But for me, it has to be someone who's got that kind of robustness about their play. And I just haven't seen it with him. And it's nothing against him as a person. You know, he is, by all accounts, an absolutely top pro, fantastic around the dressing room, you know, real big leader in that dressing room. But when I see him play and when I see him you know, jumping out of positions and being dragged all over the place, for me, someone that, again, someone who used to play there, you know, it... it, it I don't want to say it makes my skin crawl, but I get really uncomfortable watching it because I'm just like, you know, it's, it's, it's there by design. Teams are picking us apart just by doing this sort of analysis on them. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. It's basically the lack of security that yeah. I guess that position really should be the linchpin of your mid. So whilst you are moving about quite often and you're getting pulled about, you're completely removing the security yeah. that you're supposed to provide. And I feel like it's night and day, the Man City performance away to, to at home, like with Kante. Yeah. The defensive security that Kante provided was superb because it literally knitted the entire back six together. Like, literally. So I just, like, I fully understand. Pels, from a coaching perspective, um, how do you feel like Lampard can manage this? Um, and also, do you agree with what Joe's saying in terms of defensive solidity um, that Jorginho, I guess, kind of sacrifices often? Um, I, think it's, I think it's a difficult one in that um, I believe that the, the Kante move is, obvious, is, is based around what is coming in potentially. Um, and if Kante plays, you know, further forward, that's one less space for a creative midfielder, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that that rejig is, is done with, with one eye on kind of how the team progresses forward. Um, Question, uh, with, with that, do you actually rate that though? Do you rate that Lampard is doing that at this very moment in time when there's a lot on the line? Do you actually rate him that he's not only projecting and forward thinking, but do you rate that he's like, you know what, I'm not going to wait till next season. I'm going to do this now. Do you rate um, I think... I mean, I, I guess I've never really thought, I haven't thought about it in that I feel like partly it was, it was enforced mm. um, because Jorginho obviously got suspended in the last game. Um, and I, I almost think it, it might have been a safer thing to do to, to, to ensure that he, you know, would still have Kante and Kovacic playing as opposed to maybe throwing in Gilmore. So you could look at it like that. Um, but yeah, I, I guess... And I, and I guess the, the follow-up is that he, he actually played really well against Villa. So mm. then you think, hmm, this actually makes a bit of sense. Um, whereas maybe, you know, before he was adamant that, you know, Kante was a, could play in the right centre mid, centre mid role. And I, and I guess he still believes that. But there was no, there, this is the first time, this is the first occasion in which it's been trialled. Um, so I do think part of it is maybe enforced. Uh, with me, I think the, the thing about Jorginho um, isn't even so much that, like, I understand the angle that kind of Joe's coming from in terms of you do need a degree of, like, athleticism to play in that role. Um, but then I think if Jorginho was not just a Perlo-type player, but a Perlo-level player, mm. so you can make more of a case for him playing there. Um, but what, I've, what I look at now in hindsight is, like, when, I watch, when I've watched games 
back or when I look at him, I think, actually, is your passing, you know, yeah. a nine out of ten? Yep. Mm-hmm. Is your kind of chance creation, obviously, albeit from a deeper position, but is your chance creation, you know, a nine out of ten? Can you do... The, are the weight of your passes, like, fantastic? Or your, the, the balls you spray out wide and the speed and the tempo? Like, there's those kind of things that I kind of have started to look at and actually think, you know what? It's not really, you know. It's, maybe it's a seven and a half. And, then, and I don't know if you can make a case um, for someone doing something, um, a specific role, but not to a fantastic standard and then having all of the limitations that he has. Um, so I understand why, you know, to some extent, he, he wouldn't be perceived as, like, unsellable. Mm. Um, I understand why people would want another defensive mid. I think that the, not only does the Kante stuff exacerbate that, but um, just... I've watched it and just thought, you know, in transition, sometimes we look a bit lucky. And it makes sense to have a Partey in there or mm-hmm. a Samari in there or a Zakaria in there. It makes, like, I can understand why those sorts of names would be people that we would look, be looking at to kind of plug that gap. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he's, he's, a, he's still a good player, um, but I just don't think he, he's not the kind of the saviour to the system um, and that, that almost we we perceive them to be. And obviously part of that is because what we knew of Sari was what we knew of Sari and Jorginho. And we felt like he was integral to, and he probably was integral to what Sari wanted to do. And that's, that's no smart on him. But it just, it's just that whatever he, he's capable of doing, um, you know, isn't just isn't that impressive. That's the truth for me. Um, and I think that's so okay. Proud. I'm so proud of Pulisic. <laughs> I'm, I'm, sh- well, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. I'm beaming from Copenhagen. You know what it is? I'm shocked because I didn't expect Pels to really just lay it all out on 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 his video. Because, <laughs> no, I mean, he, 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 because Pels, obviously, he's part, he part of the coach's quarter. So, I, I, I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Really, no, I, really. I'm, no, but even, I think with it, yeah, it's just because I think just even on that, yeah, it's, it's important to recognise the like the difference um, that he brings, or the difference that another style of DM would bring, basically. So I'm not saying it's not to say that he's a bad player, but obviously, don't ruin it, don't ruin it, pal. No, no, but then he's so he's obviously <laughs> you were doing so, so well. No, nah, he's obviously he, he's obviously a good player, but it's just that I guess on the flip side, you ha- you do have to consider the limitations and you do have to consider like, where it's else true. you can... It's true. It's true. Where, there's, there's definitely players with a, with a better balance or with a better mesh of either what he brings. Um, I think... And I think Gilmore also um, highlighted it because there's just some of, the, some of the passes he played, you know, when he played for, against um, Everton specifically or Absolute Liverpool. Facts. I just thought, like, I didn't feel like I missed Jorginho. And if oh. I feel like I, if I don't miss someone, it's because your quality isn't to the standard that maybe people perceive it to be. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I look at the... I don't want to be 2J right now. <laughs> <laughs> but Let it I go. It is. Let what, it go. I, what, what I will say, when it comes to progressing play, I feel like Jorginho is slightly overstated. Only slightly. One thing that I think Jorginho is excellent at is passing under pressure. So yeah. get the ball out wide and into, uh, obviously, the, the central midfielders um, in, in advance of him. Like, oh, no problem. He could pop that off. No one touch problem. quality. He's one touch no problem. problem. Like, his one touch passing is incredible. That being said, when it comes to press, uh, progressing play, when you, you're up against a deeper um, side, where you don't need to pop off one time because you're not getting pressed, he struggles. And I feel yeah. like there's a big difference in, in, in the range of passing, the punchiness of the pass in comparison to Gilmore. Gilmore, even if he's not being... Because pro- I thought Gilmore could do the one touch as well. Maybe not as great as Jorginho, but when it comes to progressing actual play and breaking the lines when it's not set, when, it, when the team is set, He's all over it. George, yeah. I feel like Gilmore is far more effective in a, a more static um, defensive setup when it comes to breaking lines. I think Jorginho needs a little bit of disruption to cause anarchy. So the, the one t- those first time passes um, against what's it, the first time pass against Liverpool, the first time pass against um, was it Watford? Against yeah. Watford for Tammy Abraham's goal. That all arose when a team is not quite set but they're about to get set. Do you get what I mean? So there's a bit of destabilization, and he exploits that, and that's fantastic. 
but that happens very rarely in a in a match. It's not yeah, you're not gonna get that consistent. You're not gonna get that opportunity to do that assist consistently in a game. So And what Pell said about the the being elite at things like in terms of when you're in that when you're in that position, like are you as good as a passer as Perlo or you know, like even if you look at someone like Busquets, yeah, Busquets yeah. athletically, he's he's crap. Like yeah, well, he's better than Jorginho, though. That's the thing. But, he, but he's so sick at you know, like everything. His yeah, is wavy, <laughs> though. Like so, you know, when you're comparing players like that to Jorginho, then man, there are elite at the other things that they do, but they like basically you start asking yourself this: Is the payoff and the trade-off worth it? Yeah, exactly. You need yeah, to start asking yourself that. One prefers the Scottish variety still. You get you know? I mean, <laughs> you know I mean. But again, it's still early. We might be overstating and overstepping in terms of Gilmore. But from what I've seen, I think I, I, I prefer prefer Gilmore. Um, but again, so given our performances the last couple of days, um, um, obviously the winning at Villa, winning at City, where do you feel like we absolutely need strengthening? Because obviously I feel like we've addressed a lot of our um, attacking issues. I still feel like we've still got a one missing piece um, with Kai. Hopefully, I'm praying we get him in, man. Um, but we're, seem- we're seemingly trying to address our um, offensive um, aspect. Now, in terms of the defensive side and other areas of the pitch, is there anywhere else that you feel like we really need work? Um, that's yeah. a open-ended question, Carlos. Yeah. Drop the list, pals. Um, mate, I if I if I like had all the time in the world, we would be up until seven a.m. I hear you, bro. We <laughs> are very, very, very dodgy, and it's not. And today is today. Yeah, today is like us performing at ten or oh, nine. Levels, yeah, out of ten. Do you get what I mean? That is like the level of switched on and the level of like you've got to be immense to kind of to to shut out City more or less from open play, um, and to and obviously not have a recognised striker. Um, so today is like a an outlier of our performances. Generally speaking, from set pieces we're dodgy. Um, our transition, which obviously is affected by the DM um, and just that kind of midfield setup, sometimes mm-hmm. like how we we're so easily counted on. Um, I think we're soft sometimes. Um, I think the goal that we conceded against Villa was like, a, oh, here we go again. Cool. And that shouldn't, that shouldn't be how you feel when you're watching a really ominous or imperial, imperious team. You need to feel as though um, you're never going to concede. And I think Liverpool fans don't feel like they're going to concede. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I, and so, so when I'm watching um, some of our kind of just some of our players within, the, within that setup, I'm scared. Kepa is scary. Um, Alonso is scary. Emerson is scary, unfortunately. Rudiger is damn scary. And um, I don't think Zuma's that much different to Rudiger. Um, yeah. I think Christensen today like, had a blinder, and I know he hasn't played like that enough, but I, st- I would still champion him or, or say that he is our, he's probably our highest potential defender. I think Tomori has been our best probably defender this year. Mm-hmm. But they, to me, those two don't make... Um, a, yeah, a good pairing and a long-lasting partnership. So you you 100% need a centre back. You 100% need a left back, and you 100% need a new keeper. Um, yeah. And I can't see us doing all of those things in this summer. And I don't have a problem with that because um, you know it has to work. Yeah, it's, it's just it's just not feasible. Um, but 100%, we need to be looking at um, means of shoring up in terms of better individuals so that they don't have to perform at a nine out of ten every day. But their seven out of ten is the equivalent to a Rudiger nine, basically. Nice. Um, that's a, that's kind of where I'm at with that. Uh, I, I I know that I I just get the feeling that it's something that they they're thinking about. Um, mm-hmm. And um, yeah, even like Kepa today, like he didn't have much to do, and I still feel like he made a bit of a meal of things. And and that's a, that's really worrying. Exactly. Um, yeah. So for me, we do have to um, be. We do have to be kind of shrewd um, as well. Um, you don't need to spend a hundred million. I think I like for all the grief I give Aspi, I think he's a fantastic signing. And I, from what I recall, he was like seven million. Seven million pounds yeah. yeah, from, Mar- from Marseille. So you can get good quality players. 
for little money. You don't have to spend 70 million on Chilwell. Please don't. God, please don't. Um, <laughs> or, um, you know, 90 million on a centre half yeah. or, or 72 million on a keeper that flipping can't catch a cold. So there's obviously, you know, a need for us to really, really recruit well and to, to do our due, due, due diligence in that process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's 100%. They're needed. All of them are needed. And What's, and, what's interesting for me, yeah, is that with all later signings, so obviously Werner, um, Ziyech, you can look at them and say, you know what? Yeah, you, you offer me value for money. Like, from what I'm getting, I know there's a degree of value for money, right? So with Kepa, that was a big unknown. A big unknown. You don't necessarily need to spend that amount of money on a goalkeeper, right? You want to get someone in that's good and solid. Not necessarily need to be fantastic or elite, but solid is enough. I feel like, yeah, I don't, I don't feel you absolutely need, in certain areas, I don't think you need absolutely supreme talent, right? So in goal, I think you need to be just solid and um, safe. Don't need to be top and elite. Like a Bert Leno, for example, I think is an assured goalkeeper, a very good goalkeeper, but not of the elite bracket. But that's okay, because I still think he's one of the best keepers in the league. So, again, Chilwell, I don't feel you'll get value for money. You just, it just doesn't make any sense. It's a, it's a silly signing. Where, whilst there's other left backs that are way, maybe not even, I could even say way better. I will say way better, but also present way better value for money and also have a bigger upside. You know what I mean? So, and then they become, like, once you buy them expensive, they become very difficult to shift as well. So it's just, yeah, I, I fully agree on those positions. In terms of centre-back, million percent goalkeeper, million percent um, and left-back, of course, absolutely. I fully agree. Is there any disagreements? Or is there any other areas that you, you boy as well, want to touch on? Any other areas? Or is it, those, those are the main three areas, right? Yeah, agree with pals, yeah. Yeah, I feel we've been linked with Uma Pekano, um which is would be interesting because he he fits the profile of a dominant and you know strong central defender, but he's still very young, and you did you there's a a degree of uncertainty about what you get when it translates to the Premier League as well. So it's just like I I don't know as much as I'd like him. Because you guys know, I've t- I touted him like, a couple of weeks ago was, like, who I'd want to buy. But I'm kind of having second thoughts because I want someone that's quite a bit, a bit further on in their career. Um, similar qualities, um, but just solid. So like um, Jay um, suggested quite a few weeks ago now, a, like a Tyrone Mings, for me, would make sense in terms of a signing. He's not supreme. He's not super elite. But he's a very solid defender. And I left-footed. think he'll give you a left footed as well. And I think he'll give you the seven out of tens every other week. And that's solid enough. In terms of that assurance and um, certainty, I think um, he'd be a good signing. Um, in terms Isn't of he a Chelsea fan as well, Meads? Uh, I think he is. He's got, he's got some Chelsea connections, his dad or something. Yeah, he's got Chelsea links. So Tyrone Mings would make a. Um, AD Mings, wouldn't it? A fitness coach here? Yeah, something like yeah. that. I love how Joe's saying it as if he doesn't know that that's... Like, he knows the vibes. Yeah. He knows. I, I, I can't, I can't <laughs> drop it in there like, yeah, I know this for a fact every single there. time. He plugs it in there, he knows. He knows. <laughs> he knows. Oh, one, um, the computer is just turning. The one um, transfer that I'd want to see happen, I think, more so than any at the moment, is definitely um, Tagliafico at the moment. Yeah. I, feel like, I feel like, in terms of, like Pearl said, we, we're not going to get all these transfers done like in terms of goalkeeper, centre back and left back. But I feel where we where we can solve a few problems to begin with in terms of Tyre Fico being defensively he's more defensively minded than he is attacking. Mm. So already I feel like that will help out the centre backs to a degree. Do do you feel like the left back is more important than getting a centre back? Right now <laughs> I, it's hard to like. I don't think it's more important, but I think the the problems that a left back solves, you kind of you can kind of kill two birds with one stone to yeah, an extent. Yeah, because side and the yeah, because, oh, yeah, because the, the the distribution from Alonso and the lack of defensive mouse is scary. So yeah. to get rid of that, 
and to get someone in that takes care of the ball, do you know what I mean? Doesn't doesn't just knock it down the line and, yeah, and yeah. you know send them into blind. Very considered. Yeah, do you know what I'm saying? And then he's got work rate. He's aggressive, defensively switched on, and I feel like having someone like Rudiger there, who has got the ability to just like you know go and drop a two out of ten whenever he, like just randomly. Yes. Like someone like Tele if you could be in there at left back, I think it kind of helps shore up the defence a little bit. It won't shore it up the way we want it to be, like in terms of what a, what a new centre back would probably be. But, but everything doesn't no. need to be done in one window, really and truly. Exactly. Um, I think that's a big sign. Yeah, everything doesn't need to be done in one window. And ultimately, like you guys know very much, I'm aware that I like to address the attack first. Then the defence, don't worry, we'll sort that off. <laughs> We'll see that after. So address the attack because a lot of our problems stem from the lack of cutting edge and scoring goals. And I feel like once you start giving it, uh, the opponents um, the fear that, okay, these lot can score at will, then really and truly our, our defence will not be troubled that much. And so we did it again today as well. Yeah, we did so it again today as well. Let's not forget, we missed yeah, chances we, again today. Like, exactly. We, so you need a cutting edge. And once you have a cutting edge, teams will start to worry. So you start worrying teams rather than worrying about what teams can do to you. You know what I mean? Um, but we're going to move on to a couple of listeners' questions. Um, I'm going to answer some from the Discord. Um, I've got a couple here. Mm. We've already answered about our thoughts about Kante being playing the number six. Okay, here's one. Um, looking at our remaining fixtures and United's, um, who do you believe should be getting top four? And also, um, looking at Leicester and their form, do you think we could get third? And that's a question from Michael97. Guys, you think third? Jay, yeah. Jay, yeah. Jay's dancing. Uh, Jay's yeah. been talking about third for a long time still. And, you know, Leicester have been in free fall for not even, like, since before um, the lockdown. And obviously the stoppage of playing football. So Leicester are looking in really bad way. And obviously we're one point behind them now. You know, goal difference. Their goal difference is a lot healthier than ours. But yeah, I think we could do it. I think we could do it. And Leicester have still got to play Manchester United, I believe. Uh, Last game of the season, isn't it? And they've got got Spurs. And they've got Spurs. So it's looking very problematic for them and they've obviously now because we've won we've pulled them into the top four race now it's not you know so they're not a banker because before I felt I felt like Leicester were a banker to, and a shoe in to finish in the, in the top four but now it looks like it's slipping for them really and I um, think the confidence that this gives us after beating C is a lot I think is massive, yeah. you know? massive. I feel like it was a massive we're win. going into the next games like two three games now, I think we're thinking yeah and we, right. we play Leicester at the weekend um, in the FA Cup. Um, and, uh, yeah, what a message it sends to, to the, I guess, our rivals. Because I'm pretty sure that they were looking at this fixture thinking, yeah, you know what? This is where we can calm it. little drop point still. Yeah. I know a certain <laughs> man like Disu was starting to calculate how many, how many points we're going to get or how many points we're getting from now. Yeah. Bum. Anyway. Um... <laughs> Um, what's this one? How how much of a priority should um, the FA Cup be for us this season? I feel like the FA Cup really should always be a priority for us because it's a title. Frank loves winning the FA Cup. Um, what about you guys? I, I, I'm always always for it, man. All, all for it. I would have said before before this game, I would have said massive massive priority. It's the only thing we can really win this season. And I think again for Lampard, like, first trophy of his managerial career, like, as a platform for next season. Imagine Frank winning a cup. Yeah. Like, you know, he's, and he's got, he's got loads of history in it as well. Loads of history. Yeah. He won it loads of times himself. But after today's game and looking at how the, the team ended, I mean, I, I could see Lampard doing, like, an 11-man rotation for that game. I think we still have a decent team out, but I just don't know how... I don't want to say like how seriously he's going to take it, but I have a feeling that we're going to see quite a bit of rotation for the weekend. So if we get through that game, I think we're still with a decent chance. But it feels to me like, uh, you know, with certain players that we're looking to try to get, that little Champions League spot's looking a bit closer now. Lampard's kind of, you know, focusing on that a bit more. But it's, it's, it should be a priority every season. It's one of the best things to win in, in, in football. Yeah. But do you not also think that Leicester might be looking at us winning, being a point behind them as well, and they're probably thinking, ooh, you know what? We've got a game on Tuesday or Wednesday. 
let's rest a lot of yeah. our players. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I think again, it could be the same for both teams. Yeah, it's a good point. It'll be the same for both teams. It'll be the yeah. same for both teams, and that makes it an open game. You know what I mean? Unless and our academy is better than this. Exactly. <laughs> Unless this team ain't that deep, their squad isn't that deep. So um, I think RLC will play that game as well. I think I think hopefully, yeah. Um, I want Madison to play that game though. Yeah, so you can see who shines. I know, bro. I, I see the vision. Don't worry. I see the. <laughs> I see the vision. Um, obviously, we've got West Ham and then Watford after, um, and then Palace. So our run of fixtures, are, I, I think the run of fixtures that we thought was like, okay, it's really tough. I think we considered obviously Man City and Liverpool. Um, and Wolves on the final day. But I feel like if we create a small buffer, this five-point buffer is um, very, very useful because I think quite a few of these other teams are going to be playing each other. I feel we can kind of secure top four, probably within a, within a week or so, or two weeks. So it's looking possible. It's looking possible, man. Um, also, just got a few comments on... Um, Frank Lampard and his comments on um, Raheem Sterling um, and other black coaches. Um, that was, again, from um, Michael97. Um, what were your thoughts on um, Frank Lampard's rebuttals to Sterling's comments? A bit misplaced, I'd say, off the okay. bat. Um, I would say that the way that they were presented to him weren't really how Sterling said them. So I think he's kind of gone on the back foot and been defensive. Yeah. When I don't think that they were actually presented in the, the way that Sterling said them. But I think a little bit misguided. It was a little bit disappointed in, in, in Lampard. Um, but I do think that he has had this kind of chip on his shoulder from a player. You yeah. know, like that, that nepotism thing that he's had with, with Redknapp at West Ham and all the grief he used to get. So I don't think he's really kind of reacted well in the moment. I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to give him the benefit of doubt because it's Lampard. But I, I was still quite disappointed overall, I think, with with his approach to, to the question, for me, particularly because it's, it's fairly obvious that it is a problem and that, you know, he he is more eloquent than most footballers, so I think he should have been able to speak on it a bit better as well. But For me, I was quite disappointed, um, but also I don't really expect much from many people. So yeah. when he was posed with that question, I was like, OK, Frank, here's the opportunity. But I knew, like, ultimately, he's going to answer from a place of, like you said, he was a footballer, Everything that he's had, he, he, feel, he believes he's worked for, and there isn't an element of privilege. But the reality is, Frank, there was privilege. You yeah. were, your, your, uncle, your uncle isn't going to root for you to fail. Ultimately, he's going to put you in the best conditions for you to do as best as you can. That is a privilege. Ultimately, you still have to work hard. That isn't taken away from the amount of... I feel like people kind of get this idea of privilege and working hard won't necessarily go hand in hand. Yeah, no. they're not mutually exclusive, yeah. They're not mutually exclusive, exclusive at all. You still will have to work hard or may have to work hard when um, once the privilege is provided to you. It's just the opportunity. And that opportunity, you still have to take it and run with it. So Frank ultimately ran with it and made the most of his career and now is doing the same as ma in management. But when you get guys that are like Stephen Warnock, that are probably on their 20th job, that consistently fail, but yeah. they're consistently getting the jobs, I think Frank needs to take a, take a step out. Because I feel like he attributed and applied that question personally, um, rather than looking at the entire problem in itself. Um, but if he yeah. has to take a step out of himself, and out, I guess out of his feelings as well, um, he would probably recognise, okay, yeah, this is actually an issue, because there are people that are consistently failing but consistently getting opportunities relative to my black peers that have been coaching for probably as long as I have or even longer, but not getting the opportunities. It's just, yeah. if you take a step away and start actually rationalising things um, without emotion, which is difficult, yeah. it's not you easy. You know, it's not easy. Um, but also it's like um, rabbit in the headlights. Bang. He's asked a question and he's like, oh shit. What do I do? So I'm not going to blame him entirely, but also I was somewhat disappointed, kind of not. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I think yeah. Um, on it, I think he just, like you said, he missed the point to me. That's the bottom line yeah. in terms of, he might, and he might not have known the comments, but to be honest, I feel like he would have, whenever it came out, because I know um, Sterling did quite a big interview. So yeah. I feel like he would have seen it. Um, and I just think he's missed the point. I, I think it, like you said, it was applied and taken personally. Um, and what I, 
I've written about this quite a bit as well in terms of like lack of opportunities for for, for black coaches. Mm. But I think with regards to um, his response, what I what I found useful or or basically the other week, um, Gareth Southgate was on was on Sky Sports and he said that he got his job at Middlesbrough. I think in 2006, he said he was on he he was inexperienced. He didn't have the experience or the necessary you know mm. expertise to to get the job. Um, and on the flip side, with Frank's comments, I think he probably doesn't recognise that there is there is an element of privilege in that you, your first job is Derby County. Mm-hmm. Um, I read that. Um, yeah. I read that Harry Redknapp said that you know he 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 got him he got on the phone to like the Ipswich chairman and he, when Mick McCarthy was leaving and he got got on the phone to Mel Mel Morris at Derby. Um, now, for me, um, I don't. I like that's there's it's just plain and simple. Like how many, um, you know, how many just the coach coaches on average, not, not black or white, scrap that. Coaches. How many of them coaches would have like the ability for someone to kind of lobby on their behalf, albeit you still have to interview and you have to do a good job, which he did at Derby, which he did at Derby, and what he's done here. Mm-hmm. Um, but the initial step, someone you know helped just get you an interview. Um, right. or, or get your conversation. You were vouched um, for. Ultimately, you were vouched for. Exactly, and I think um, the average, the average coach isn't vouched for. But um, with, I guess, um, kind of, I do think a, a stigma plays a part in terms of if I ask any anyone to name managers, five managers right now off the bat, they probably will be white. Um, mm-hmm. Just, just out of nature. I, I remember, like, when I was growing up, the, the best managers in the world, Wenger. Um, Ferguson, those are the managers that are stuck in my head. So it's, that bias is obviously going to be there in terms of who you perceive to be capable of management, managing also. And I don't think that whether or not that that's deliberate or not, that I, it's a factor. Um, but I do, I, do I, I, I hear you. Um, but for me, that's the thing. I guess it's different eras, right? So I grew up under, under Hoodlet. So I already yeah, yeah, knew fair. a black manager could do it. So fair. I already knew, and he was successful at the club. Like, one of the most successful managers that yeah, we've had. Sick. So... I already knew that the capabilities of, I've, I don't feel like the race element necessarily would impact how well a, man, a manager can manage. Well, well, it's not, not, so, not so much how well. No, I know, but it's just, in terms of just like the visual cues, I guess. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. What I'm seeing is white managers being successful. And yeah. you're not seeing any black managers get an opportunity. So I guess in the psychology, you're already knowing or you're already assuming if you're to mention any black manager. Yeah. You're not uh, going to, because you're not going to be presented with that opportunity. They're not there. They weren't there. So I get it. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think even just in the cases that um, Raheem Sutton used in terms of Sol Campbell and Ashley Cole, I've, like for instance, Lampard's one is kind of even more extreme in that he didn't have any job before Derby. Whereas it, whereas with Gerard, he like he went to under eighteen, did a bit of time yeah. there. Arteta, you can say you know he's done done some sort of like apprenticeship prior yeah. to this. Whereas he kind of just jumped straight into it, and it's like. Um, you don't want you don't want to deal with or pick on specific cases in terms of Ashley Cole or Sol Campbell. Yeah. But on the flip side, it's like, do they have that luxury or that privilege to kind of do the same things? And I just it, it would have been nice to have maybe heard a little bit more of a considered response. Right. Um, yeah. I, agree. Yeah. I do think I do think though it is slightly different in the sense that I think Frank did do some work with Chelsea. Um, I wouldn't say for a long period of time. I think he was doing his badges at Chelsea. Um, yeah. But I think he was partaking in a couple of coaching sessions um, under Jody and Joe Edwards. But I think his route, I don't think that you necessarily need to have a, a route by going into youth football and progressing that way. But I think that, that way might... I think that... I feel like when you go through youth football, I think that almost sets you up to being a great number two. And I think that's why a lot of men, or some, I guess, well, Frank, in Frank's case, he wanted to bypass that because he didn't want to be a number two. He wanted to be number one. So he wanted to dive in straight ahead. Like, and that's why I, would, I, I, I don't know. That's why I find it quite difficult when youth coaches and coach of academies try and be managers, like, as in actual football first team coaches, because I think that transition is quite difficult. And I think generally they're ultimately always going to be seen as number two. If you get what I mean, so mm. uh, yeah, I, yeah. Get, I get I get the angle in terms of like youth development and just the yeah. the, the emphasis probably on kind of 
developing the individual in the way that a coach would as opposed to like, you know, getting three points. Yeah. Um, but I th- the, the one thing I would say um, that, that Dan mentioned that I, feel, I thought was like a point that I hadn't really considered is that, um, you know, in, in these cases, I think when you're high profile, but you're also in the limelight in the same way that Lampard was in terms of he was on TV, yep. he was kind of like, and it was quite, it's been quite close to when he's retired. He's yep. still got a, a level of relevance that maybe kind of gives people like a glow. It amplifies so can, him a bit. So it amplifies him, certainly. Um, and Gerard did the same thing in terms of within almost two years, it's like, I'm going to do this. Um, and I remember hearing like ages ago that like at, you know, St. George's Park, they thought, you know, Gerard's going to be an amazing manager sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think um, that that's something that potentially has maybe worked against someone like Stoke Campbell in that um, Dan was mentioning that he did take a little bit of a break. break break Um, And it's like maybe your moment of like peak relevance, like where you're like the kind of hot topic, Sol Sol Campbell's retired, dot, dot, dot kind of thing. That's Um, actually quite interesting because if you do get it, remember Rude Hullet, he was player manager. Yeah, so he was, yeah. there was an element of, so I get it, the relevance, right? So he had a lot of equity at the club yeah, to actually do it and to be considered. So I get it. I get Dan's angle. It, like, like you said, it wasn't something that I really considered, but I then I fought back to Rude and I thought, you know what? That actually really applies. It's actually very, very relevant. Very relevant. Um, I'm pretty sure that was before my, I'm pretty sure it was before I was born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was. So Phyllis is probably was fifteen. When, when Lampard, <laughs> fifteen, oh, fuck off, Joe. <laughs> when Lampard made his comments, though, I think he should have also like shone a light on the fact that he is lucky enough to have people in the footballing world that can. Mm-hmm. And then when he said, "Oh, you know," but I've also worked hard. People would have been like, "Yeah, cool, you've worked hard, but you've also shown you've also shone a light on the fact that yeah, it did matter." Actually, that. yeah, do you get what I'm saying? And I think that would have made it a little less sour, if you get what I'm saying, like right. the comments that he made, because he would have acknowledged the fact that, yeah, my, my, my uncle is a manager, a well-respected manager, and, you know, like my cousin's a pundit, and like every, all, everybody's in football. I've been so, connected. Yeah, so I've got connections. So I think if he had just said that, it would have made people feel like, oh, well, like, at least somebody gets it. Do you know what right. I mean? Right. Whereas now he's just made it look like, well... I, like, I'm, I'm kind it of missing sound, it well. sounds a bit tone deaf. Uh, yeah. I completely yeah, agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I completely agree. But yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. It is what it is. But I feel like these kind of conversations will help, um, especially with him as well. Um, so maybe at some point we'll kind of kind of broach that topic, but we'll see. But really appreciate you guys for coming on. Massive yeah, win probably. today. Um, hopefully that clarifies our prof- Buzzing, mate. Because I can't lie, before today, before kickoff, I was I was shook. I wasn't saying much because I I wasn't really feeling it. So yeah, Yeah. really happy with the performance. Obviously, we've got Leicester um, away in the FA Cup this um, this Sunday. Um, Yeah, hopefully we do it, man. Hopefully next week Thursday we'll have some more news. You know, on the twenty nine, you know, kind of (laughs) have a little. So hopefully we'll have some news breaking um, when we record the podcast and I'll uh, we'll see you next week. For any other um, Touchline related stuff, um, our podcast comes out on Sunday. So yeah, check us out and I'll see you boys next week. Good. Bless. Cheers. Yeah. When I spit bars in a ring, man I go hard like Santana.